Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Tom Blackburn. I'm a partner at Gunner Cook, and from the title, I think you can probably guess that I deal with costs. Today's um, webinar is titled Five Lessons for Litigators to Never Forget. Um, it's, you'll be pleased to know the good news is that I don't plan on speaking for an hour. Uh, 40 minutes is an absolute maximum. The other good news is uh, to those three of you who are probably listening, hi mum, um, being one of them, uh, I realise that costs is a dry subject. Um, therefore, I'll be including the odd picture that I find whimsical and funny, hopefully to keep you all awake. Uh, but this is meant to be a very sharp, uh, short, quick overview on things that litigators should be thinking about and should be at the forefront of most of your minds as you run through um, litigation. My practice is 100% costs and funding. My clients range from top 10 firms to top 100 firms, boutique, sole practitioners, FTSE 100 companies, banks, etc. Now the types of cases that I'm instructed on um, also vary significantly. So it's from drafting retainers, uh, on large group litigation matters involving thousands of claimants and significant damages to very actually um, short applications to depart both upwards and downwards from budgets uh, to drafting bills, drafting budgets and detailed assessments. Basically, if it has anything to do with costs, I normally get involved. And the aim of today, other than keeping you awake, uh, is to hopefully make you more money in terms of billing in the long run, um, but as a bare minimum to increase your client retention and satisfaction. And the way in which I'll do that is to talk to you about these five things. I did tell you uh, that I was there will be slightly whimsical um, and dramatic pictures. There's the first. I call these the, five, the four horsemen and their friend. These are the five things um, that litigators should always be thinking about. Hourly rates, retainers, proportionality, cost budgeting and part 36. And I'm going to spend five minutes absolutely tops on each. So getting started with hourly rates. That picture is a picture of a Nokia, I think it's 5310. And the reason why I've included that is because the last time the guideline hourly rates were updated was 2010. And in 2010, that phone outsold iPhones by five to one. Well, I think that 2010 was really yesterday, uh, or it certainly feels quite recent. It's, it's nine years ago since the, the guideline hourly rates were updated. But furthermore, the guideline hourly rates are fundamentally misunderstood. And the reason why I say that is because they were designed for fast track cases that, are, that conclude at a one day trial or less. Now, I'm not sure about the two of you listening, and I'm, I'm definitely sure about my mum who's listening, uh, but I've not conducted a fast track case in easily probably five, six, seven years. Um, so the fact that they're designed for something and most of us use them for something else is the main reason why I've included the forefront of the five things that none of us should ever forget is that the whole industry misunderstands hourly rates. And the important thing really here is that we're all subject to two key factors in our career, which are the numbers of hours that we work, either the numbers of hours that we record on our case management system and our hourly rate. That determines our billing. Our billing normally determines our bonus, our base salary, um, our route to partnership, how much equity we get in said partnership, um, and it determines most key work decisions um, taken by others. So I think hourly rates should be understood better by everybody, but at least if you don't understand them, talk to a, an expert. Most of us don't charge. Um, for chatting to people about hourly rates um, and get a better feel. So I've talked about what, what the guideline hourly rates 2010, what are they for? They're for fast track cases that concluded a one day trial or less. They're not for anything else, but the courts regularly use them as a baseline and use them as an anchor to then build on. Um, what the courts do get right and what most of us as practitioners re re ignore most of the time is the seven pillars of wisdom they're now eight and i'll go through them in a second um it contained in cpr 44.43 depending upon how many of those 
pillars, in inverted commas, apply to cases, I, um, when the court considers uh, those pillars against the hourly rates being claimed, uh, that will determine that exercise, how far courts go above and beyond guideline hourly rates. Um, so what I've put there is that they are horses for courses. Now, the seven pillars of wisdom are the conduct, both pre and post litigation, including the efforts made to settle, um, the value of any case, the importance of the matter to the parties, the complexity uh, of the case, the skill, effort and specialised knowledge of the practitioner, the time spent and the place and circumstances in which the work was done. Now, as a rule of thumb, and this is very more subjective and it's more of a art than a science but the senior courts costs office who deal with the biggest cost cases in the country they have a rule of thumb that if you can tick two or three of those um you can depart away from the guideline early rates quite significantly if you can tick four or five of them you're probably looking at somewhere near double and if you can tick more than five you're looking at very significant hourly rates indeed so my experience um I dealt with a case back in 2011, which dealt with costs being incurred in 2007, 8 and 9, where the other side were incurring more than £1,000 per hour. It was a billion pound damages, lots of parties, very complex. Um, and the case settled at roughly about an 80% recovery. That wasn't because uh, my job as the paying party. Um, I didn't do it very well. It was because all of the pillars of wisdom had been ticked in that case and we knew the court would depart away very, very significantly. Now, that uh, that's a once in a decade type case. But the problem that I see day in, day out is that litigators don't really understand the seven pillars and don't really understand how significantly they could depart away from the guideline early rates. And these are, are clients not just in London, but Manchester, Bristol, Birmingham, Leeds, wherever, etc. Um, they look at the guideline early rates, build in a 20, 30% uplift, and that's what they charge clients, um, thinking that's what they can only get back from the other side. And this brings me to the last point, which is some clients can't or won't pay what you could recover from the other side, i.e. what you could get back into parties. And this is the problem, is that if you sit down with a client on a complex matter, worth, I don't know, one million pounds, um, and you say to them, these are the guidelines, these are my normal hourly rates, but actually this case is more difficult, it's more valuable, it's more important, and so I propose uh, that I charge X. Some clients either can't or won't pay X, or actually you're part of a beauty parade, um, and as part of that beauty parade, your X is actually higher than everybody else's, so that you don't receive the instruction. There is a mechanism for you to recover greater hourly rates into parties and for you to charge the client something different. And that's the next topic. So hourly rates misunderstood, speak to a practitioner. Um, most of us will tell you, actually, you're constantly told that you're not, you're charging too much. Um, hand on heart, most of you don't charge enough. The next of the five um, things that I'd like you to take away from today is creative retainers. Now, we all pay lip service to the indemnity principle, including the Court of Appeal and the Supreme Court. But the indemnity principle is, it's not dead. Um, it's certainly terminal. It's lying there and it hasn't been conscious for at least 15 years. That's slightly macabre. Um, but the, the point in relation to the, the indemnity principle is that it is possible to charge the other side X and charge your own client why that's not what it why it was created um but now it's legally possible pursuant to lots of good um court of appeal and supreme court case law that says that we can do that so we pay lip service to it and we pay lip service to it via a variety of different types of retainers such as conditional fee agreements discounted conditional fee agreements discounted conditional fee agreement lights that's not like a diet coke um it a light is a, a description of a mechanism within that retainer or by uh, and the last one on there is a fixed discounted conditional fee agreement all of those retainers allow you to charge your client x and you to recover y from the other side um, which means going back to my hourly rate point if your client only wants to be charged 
200 pounds per hour or can only afford to be charged 200 pounds per hour you could recover so long as the case warrants it and you take enough of those seven pillars of wisdom you can recover 400 pounds an hour from the other side perfectly legally by using one of these types of retainers and i draft these weekly for clients um, on some big matters on some relatively small matters because actually the difference in those two charging rates and the hundred hours that a partner may spend and the 200 hours that an associate may spend makes a big bottom line to their billing which is one of the reasons why we all come to work other than to, to spend time with our colleagues and to have fun um we are fee earners we have to earn fees therefore if you can earn more fees via these creative retainers um why wouldn't you i i regularly uh, give talks to law firms and industry as a whole most people think that dbas aren't being used by anyone they are the best kept secret i think um in litigation lots of firms are using them lots of firms are using them well and earning significant fees um some firms are using them badly uh, and are potentially negligent now the thing about a, a creative retainer is that it's never a one size fits all it's more of a smorgasbord hence the picture of a, of the blackburn dinner table on a sunday afternoon um that lovely smorgasbord on the right hand side the the whole point of a creative retainer is to take the bits that you like the bits that you want i the the ability to recover a higher hourly rate from the other side um the ability to be paid something as you go along um to charge the client less than you normally would and create some sense of good feeling client satisfaction there so to take all of the best bits that you want without any of the bits that you don't so create your own um you can tell it's lunchtime but create your own plate of a smorgasbord of all the best bits that you like um and you you make them case specific now i've got a library of 400 odd creative retainers that i've drafted for different firms if someone says tom i want this type of retainer i normally charge a couple of hours for making it case specific merit specific and party specific and then sending it out um if the client's got no money i.e they're impecunious and the law firm's not uh, being paid from their client all the way through i normally mirror that risk so i don't charge anything I, I draft the retainer i send it out it's not to me it's not rocket science because i do it day in day out uh weekly yearly etc and i have this vast library um to, to lots of people i understand how it can be slightly daunting i would say the more creative that you get um and the more bespoke that you get i wouldn't draft it yourself get counsel to draft it if you really want get me to draft it get a third party to take on that risk for you um someone who's used to doing these types of things but at the outset of any case do think creatively um so i'm advising somebody at the moment in a very large significant action that is they're almost guaranteed to win but the client can't pay um in that scenario it is perfect for a dba it relates to damages the client's happy to give a small percentage away and the law firm knows that they're only going to be acting for about nine months um so a dba is perfect in that example it wouldn't be for a case that lasts five years where a law firm needs to be paid something as they go through um hence my one size never fits all but um if you speak to somebody like me we will be able to get you the best bits and ignore the, the worst bits as it were um that's my five minutes on creative retainers moving swiftly on and this is meant to be a very summary uh, a summarized look at these key points our favorite word proportionality um those scales in the top right that you can see are, are what jackson envisaged uh the scales on the bottom right are what we've actually got the court and jackson and, and the rules committee all said we're not going to draft practice directions in relation to the new proportionality test which is contained at um cpl 44.3 it will be built up by case law over time um that simply hasn't happened we've got one high court decision in the case of may versus wavell group we've got another couple of high court cases and that's it the old test very quickly used to be you go through a line by uh the court right at the very 
outset of a detailed assessment would determine whether the costs sought were proportionate or not. Um, if they weren't, the court would go through a line by line test, examining each six minute unit in the bill. Um, and then at the end, what the court assessed is what you got. The new test in practice is that the court is meant, meant to conduct the either provisional or detailed assessment. And then at the very end, stand back and effectively have a judgment call as to the sum that they've allowed after the reductions have been made through the normal assessment process is that the new sum allowed or what, what would be allowed at the end of a normal detailed assessment is that proportionate and is that proportionate testing against five factors contained at CPR 4435 the sums in issue the relief sought the complexity the conduct of the paying party and any wider factors now the new proportionality test isn't as bad as lots of people uh, as some people may think i conducted a an assessment last week the bill was some 40 odd thousand pounds the sums in issue uh, in fact the sums um allowed at the end of trial were three thousand pounds and the court found that nearly twenty thousand pounds was proportionate so in low value matters the court normally understands that costs will always exceed damages the problem that i see and i get into is when we we're talking about mid value matters uh let's call it 150,000 pounds uh damages commercial litigation case involving some witness evidence um, and some expert evidence. Both parties are probably going to uh, to spend around £100,000 in that case. They're the cases that I see um, that are quite dangerous, that when courts stand back in the new test in practice, they can make some draconian reductions that are completely subjective. I mean, if you're a judge and I get hangry towards lunchtime, hence my smorgasbord picture, um, especially if I've exercised in the morning. Uh, if you catch me at half past one and I've not eaten, I'm going to give you a different decision than I am at half past two and I've just had a very nice lunch. I'm probably going to be more lenient. And that's the, the difficulty in the new proportionality test. However, you aren't defenseless. So if you make a part 36 offer and beat it, you get indemnity costs. Indemnity costs aren't subject to proportionality, first off. So why wouldn't you make part 36 offers? Not only that, but you can make estimates of costs. So if you notify the other side with your letter of claim that you estimate that you'll spend 25,000 pounds up to the point of issue, from issue to PTR, you'll spend another 75, and from PTR onwards, you'll spend 50. Then when the other side gets to the budgeting stage, how can they say that your estimates, so long as they're roughly in the ballpark, are disproportionate? Not only that, but as and when you win, how can the other side say the costs are disproportionate? Notify the other side of what you think your estimates are going to be relatively early on. And lastly, um, invite offers of ADR, uh, well, offer ADR, whether it be mediation, roundtable settlement meetings, anything like that. Obviously at the appropriate stages, but where the other side rejects you and they don't accept that offer of ADR, you're probably going to get your costs from that date onwards on the indemnity basis. Indemnity basis isn't subject to proportionality. The other thing that I find difficult when dealing with proportionality is when we're at the budgeting stage. So we're dealing with budgets. Uh, we are at the CCMC. The court's got the particulars, the defence, both parties' budgets. We roughly know what's being sued over, not actually what's been recovered. And the other side are saying it, we're acting um, disproportionately and the court should make a reduction accordingly. I address courts in that scenario and say, well, of the five factors that you're meant to consider, you can't consider conduct of the paying party because we don't know who the paying party is. So you shouldn't consider proportionality because you can only consider 80% of the factors that you're meant to take into account. That does find some favour. Some courts say, well, Mr Blackburn, I'll take a guess as to who will be the uh, paying party and I will make my reductions to the budgets accordingly. But if you consider proportionality at an early stage, it is an easy thing um, to offset costs which may be disproportionate. If you don't consider it, 
proceed through and then we're looking at recovering sums that are significantly more than the sums in issue, so costs that are significantly more than an issue, and we haven't taken any uh, steps to mitigate, um, then my job's a lot, lot harder, um, and you'll probably recover less. So always have proportionality at the forefront of your mind. Having spoken about cost budgets, that's our next, um, that's our next topic. Now, the reason why we've got a very good looking golden retriever on the right hand side, it's not mine, I mean, let's face it, that could be in a, a Hollywood film, is that I view cost budgeting as uh, a practitioner's best friend. So, hence dogs. Very tenuous link, I apologise, but for the two of you that are still awake, um, hopefully you get that. Now, done badly, cost budgeting is your worst enemy. Uh, if you budget badly, um, if you don't budget at all, it's it's a negligence case waiting to happen. But done well, I think cost budgeting changes the entire landscape. In a previous slide, we talked about the fact that there's only two real factors that determine billing, the number of hours that you time record and your hourly rate. There really is a third factor, which is the number of hours that you may recover. Because when I first started practicing in the in the early noughties, my supervising partner at the time said, Tom, um, you know, you'll be in the office for eight or nine hours every day. You'll probably record around five or six. There'll be some non-chargeable time that you'll record. And of those five or six chargeable, um, we'll actually discount some of them and you'll probably get three or four actually paid by clients. Um, all of that goes out of the window with cost budgeting, because if you do it well, you set your budget at 120,000. The court says you can have 110. You stick to the 110. You actually spend 109. You get 109 back from the other side. You get a very happy client because the client recovers 95% of all of their costs. So gone are the days where the client retainer letter says, um, the average recovery is around 75%. We as a firm recover slightly more because we've got really good practices. So you can probably estimate that you'll recover 80% of your costs if you're successful. All of that goes out of the window because do cost budgeting well and you end up with happier clients, spend less time in the office, more time walking your dog, more time with your family um, and your billing goes up. One thing that I do find that practitioners um, forget is that rule that I've cited there, CPR 3.131, which is unless the court orders otherwise, um, cost budgets uh, must not be exchanged later than 21 days before the first CMC. Some people are still leaving it to the seven days. Uh, there's been lots and there's been a wealth of case law on the same. Um, despite the fact that Mitchell was overturned even though the Court of Appeal says that it wasn't on Denton. The um, application for relief and the hearing for relief is very stressful. You won't be paid for the same. So let's make sure, unless the court orders otherwise, we do them 21 days before the first CMC. Very easy practice point there. I've put figures versus assumptions down there because figures, are, albeit I draft hundreds of budgets every year, the figures will always be wrong. They'll be wrong in the sense that I'll never be right to the penny. I'll probably get it quite close and I'll definitely be in the ballpark unless the case changes significantly all the way through. But the figures will always be wrong. Whereas the assumptions you can always make sure are right. The figures are actually less important than the assumptions. And I realize I'm probably doing myself out of some work here. But the assumptions are more important than figures. I say this for the following reasons. If you don't put any assumptions down, even though we are budgeting for a four day trial and the trial runs long and judgment isn't given at the end of trial, it's reserved. And there's a handing down and a long consequential issues hearing at the handing down. My job in saying, well, we obviously uh, we budgeted for a four day hearing is much, much harder than if we simply put in the assumption section in trial, we, we are budgeting for a four day trial with judgment handed down at conclusion. Ditto by way of example, disclosure. So 
My regular assumption on disclosure that I put when I'm anticipating being a receiving party is that disclosure will be conducted by way of list. It will be a one-off exercise conducted in a timely fashion. All parties will comply with directions and there'll be no supplemental disclosure by either party. I had a case recently, it settled. Unfortunately, I was looking forward to it going to assessment where the other side gave us seven rounds of supplemental disclosure. We said we got good reason to depart away from the budget. Unfortunately, the assumption section of the uh, my client's budget was blank. So we had a slightly harder task than we would do normally. Um, but where we've got that assumptions in the disclosure section, it's absolutely fine. As soon as the other side gives you some supplemental disclosure, we know we aren't constrained by that section of the budget. We can go beyond what's in the budget and we write to the other side and we tell them. Writing to the other side and telling them, pursuant to practice direction 7.6, supplementing CPR 3, is very, very important. We can't just sit back and say, well, um, they've done something that we didn't budget for that's not in our list of assumptions. Accordingly, we're going to spend more. We'll just uh, incur more, spend more, and when we win, we'll recover more. No, we should write to the other side. Now, how we write to the other side and what we say is a is a judgment call. It's a tactical decision for you guys with conduct. I'll have input. I'll say something along the lines of, well, trials in four weeks' time, there's no need to make an application to amend upwards or downwards. We're not, we won't have it heard in time. Let's write to the other side and notify them and estimate what we believe our costs are going to be. But where it happens a year before trial, let's write to the other side, tell them what we think it will be, upwards or downwards, um, give a good estimate and seek their consent. Where they don't consent, let's put them on notice that we intend to make an application and they'll be um, liable or their client will be liable for the costs of that application and then we make it. It is much easier to make an application to vary a, a budget upwards or downwards than it is to simply say a detailed assessment, um, this happened, we didn't uh, budget for it, and accordingly we wanted to depart away from a budget because every master in the SDCO and all regional cost judges will simply come back with a question, well, why didn't you make an application? That isn't to say it's not impossible, we're just making our lives easier and your life easier. But I do think those people, those practitioners that embrace cost budgeting, even on cases that are worth more than 10 million pounds, um, even on cases that budgeting doesn't apply to, let's ask the other side to budget. It is a great tactical insight from your side as to, to see how much they plan on spending on settlement, to see whether they are planning on a mediation, to see how many witness statements they're planning on drafting, what experts they're intending to rely on, have they got any quotes or not, etc. It's a great window into the other side's uh, case that you wouldn't otherwise get. Best friend, I'm a really big fan of it. I know some people aren't, I'll stop there. A penultimate uh, point is CPR part 36. In fact, no, it's you'll be pleased to know it's the last one. I could talk about costs all day, as I'm sure you can tell. Um, CPR part 36 is that pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. And I've raised four questions there, which most people don't think about, and I'll go through them. Does your retainer allow you or the client to keep the additional 10% of damages that your client um, or you will get if you beat your own part 36 offer at trial? capped at £75,000 pursuant to the rules. My guess is your retainer is probably silent, so it automatically goes back to the client. But because it's damages, I think that's probably the right thing to do, unless you're acting on some form of contingent fee or conditional fee, um, at which point you're taking some of the risk as well. Does your retainer allow you or your client to keep an additional 10% of costs? So post to April 2013, you can make part 36 offers on costs. If you beat your own part 36 offer on costs, you get an additional 10%. Where does that go? It should go back to the law firm, but if your retainer doesn't stipulate that, it goes back to the client. Same question on enhanced interest on damages. If you beat your own part 36 offer on uh, damages, you can recover 10% on top of um, Bank of England base rate, up to 10%. Um, where does that go? Same question on enhanced interest on costs. 
there's an automatic judgment rate of 8%, but you may get 10.75% if it doesn't stipulate in your retainer that you can keep it. Where does it go? Now, I use Part 36 offers both to settle cases, but also as a, uh, a tactical positioning point. So if you are if there is one element either within your budget or your bill that is concerning you, let's say you've gone over budget on disclosure. We think we've got good reason. We'll make a part 36 offer solely on that issue um, that if you've gone £10,000 over on disclosure, you were given 10 by the court, you've gone £10,000 over. Let's make a part 36 offer at £18,000. If we beat our own part 36 offer on that, you you will get an additional £2,000 uh, by way of costs award. Where does that go? It's to highlight most people haven't thought of the consequences and where things flow back to as a result of Part 36. But in costs, why anyone would make or wouldn't make, sorry, a Part 36 offer um, and why they make call the bank offers and without prejudice savers to costs offers, I have absolutely no idea. Part 36 used really well can actually generate more income for the firm and the client. Not only that, but I've mentioned it before, proportionality doesn't apply to costs on the indemnity basis. So another reason to make a Part 36 offer, um, not just tactically, uh, is to get costs e of either the detailed assessment process or costs of the main action um, on, the on the indemnity basis. So part 36 used really, really well, even on specific issues, um, can be a great, great tactical tool for you and your client and a great money spinner for you and your client. Any questions, please ask. Don't sit on problems. Um, and it, I, I don't really mind if you if you don't ask me and you go off to anybody else, your normal cost person, your normal counsel, whoever it might be. But don't sit on problems. Um, if we know we've gone over budget, uh, so I was a partner at a top 100 firm and we ran um, a report to find out how much we were over budget on certain cases. It was eight million pounds. Um, don't sit on those problems. Let's proactively do something about it. Uh, most of the time, all practitioners have seen what you think is a fairly unique problem before. Um, we typically don't charge for, for five 10 minute phone calls, just like you guys don't. Um, so let's have a chat, let's work through it together. Um, if it can't be solved, then um, you know I'll give you a, a fixed price on, on which to work on, but let's unearth it, blow the dust off it and deal with it um, whilst we can still do things. Let's not just hope for the best, sit on the problem until the end. And then if you've gone over budget, leave it to me to try and fix the problem at the conclusion. Um, we can. We can normally get a much, much better outcome if we grasp the nettle fairly early on. You've got the point, I won't labour it. Um, and bang on time, less than 35 minutes. That is a very, very quick overview on the five lessons for litigators to never forget. If you do take one thing away from today, uh, take the, re the creative retainers point away. If you can increase your billing without spending more time in the office, why wouldn't you? And also, if you can increase your client satisfaction without charging them more, why wouldn't you? Um, that would be the one thing that I'd ask you to all take away. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you're all awake. Um, I've been Tom Blackburn. Thank you.